Hi, right, well, uh, welcome to the podcast. Uh, my name is Yusuf, and today uh, we have Iromo. How do you? Egbert Julie. Egbert Julie with us, uh, and of course, Miss Reed. I was reading your uh, your biography, and your bio is pretty, that was great. You know, one thing I found amazing is your your background. Engineering in agriculture, right? Agricultural engineering. Yes. And how did you, you know, move from that to journalism? Uh, <laughs> okay, so sometime in, I mean, I'd always been someone who was very interested in the arts, right? So mm-hmm. growing up, I was ambidextrous, and also uh, my brain was wired such that, um, you know, I was part arts, part science. Mm-hmm. You know, and then it so happened that my parents were also one of them was um, a teacher in the arts, another in the sciences. So, you know, I'd always grown up being quite, um, what's the word, you know, in the dying, you know, being able to, to float back across from, from this mm-hmm. sphere to this sphere. And um, so when I got into uni, there was this one time where there was a riot in school, I covered it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I graduated, while I was waiting for my, you know, for all those post-graduation formalities, I just started writing in journalism, moved to Lagos, and yeah, that's it. Yeah. So <laughs> that's it. I never use my certificate anymore. So it wasn't like a, 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 a big step, it's just because you were into it since? Well, I had already been into it, so I felt like at some point, I mean, I knew that I was definitely going to be a writer, but mm. I wasn't sure if it was going to be a side thing or if it was going to be a main thing. But then, um, you know, exigencies at the time, and, um, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I think it was just fate, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, even though I'm a big believer in preparations and all that, I also see, realize that there is um, one, this luck, and there's also the hand of God, so mm-hmm. I think everything was just, it was, you know, it was like a formula that was pre-cooked or something, and I arrived at where I am. I see that you, you wrote for, you know, like the garden and, you know, major newspaper sites how is it how hard or easy it is to as an african to be able to get those platforms um it, it is tough because um journalism is full of middle-aged white men yeah uh, <laughs> and um i mean most people are interested in whether intentionally or otherwise mm-hmm. sticking to a narrative right? yes. um, and i say whether good or bad because there are people who think Mm-hmm. Oh, Africa is all about rising, it's all about positives, you mm-hmm. know, and then the people who think it's all about negatives, mm-hmm. you know, and there are also people who are doing writing this, you know, because they genuinely think that this is what it is, yeah. and then there are people who are also writing the biases. So there's all of this preset, you know, in whatever ratios and proportions. Mm-hmm. But um, many of us, you know, based on the continent, writing about the continent for our own local markets, mm-hmm. we see the way these things are, and we don't have. Um, the ambition, you know, mm-hmm. or the drive to change that. You know, we're just content with, oh, let's just write for our people back home. Yeah. You know, I mean, these are the people we're writing about, anyways. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think early on, I realized that I wanted to do more than just write for a small number of people. Mm-hmm. I realized that, you know, to get a true picture of things to a larger audience, you have to target a larger audience. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so that was it. Yeah, we were really impressed yesterday kind of doing some research on your background to see that you published in, um, like you mentioned, The Guardian, Al Jazeera, Washington Post, um, Africa Reports, uh, the BBC, um, and that you cover actually quite a the wide BBC? range of... I think oh, I don't remember. A, oh, okay. I mean, I might have. I think there was something. <laughs> just, <laughs> it was just a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean, part of what was really impressive about um, it is that you really cover a lot of different types of topics and regions, right? So we saw that you were covering, for example, the you know crisis in Anglophone um, Cameroon. Um, you know, you you were in Liberia during the Ebola crisis. Um, obviously, you cover uh, you know politics in Nigeria. Um, but also, you know, pop culture every once in a while. So you, you have this sort of wide repertoire of topics that you engage in. And so given all that, um, I guess I wanted to ask you if you could sort of think back, what has been your most, two, two things. So one, your most challenging assignment or story that you've written and sort of tell us a little bit why. 
and mm. then maybe uh, your most rewarding and and sort of maybe insightful something that mm. maybe a, a something that you worked on that was like you went in with a particular idea, but then it was surprising. Something else kind of came out of it, which, you know, maybe that happens off. Uh, okay, first, let's set the base, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so I started out as a culture journalist. Mm-hmm. I still have dreams of one day being a pop culture journalism professor. Okay. <laughs> uh, but then I started doing conflict and everyone saw that, oh, he can do conflict. And then, you know, mm-hmm. people started, um, editors started sending me on those. Um, in See. terms of most challenging, I, I mean... I think it, it, it will be around um, the time when I was covering um, insurgents, the insur- Boko Haram mm-hmm. in, in the Northeast, because um, I'm a Southerner. Mm-hmm. I can't speak Hausa. I mean, as I then, I, could, mm-hmm. I, I knew not, not a single word in Hausa, um, even though my mom speaks it. But mm-hmm. I couldn't speak anything. You know? So you're going to a new land where, first, I'm a Christian, mm-hmm. I'm a Southerner, I can't speak the language. And, you know, there's, there's just only foreign reporters there. This was around 2015, right? Where, you you know, most of the people reporting then, Boko Haram, like, peaked around 2013, 2014. Mm-hmm. So it was still dangerous. And most of the people reporting there were foreigners. You know, and I was going there without health insurance to report. Mm-hmm. And I remember initially at first, because I was a freelancer, mm-hmm. and because I was, like, you know, this... this different criteria I've mentioned, just different um, parameters. No one wanted to commission me right ahead. So I had to mm. like dive straight in, take my savings. And um, for the first week, I think I was sleeping on the floor, my fixer's floor, right, before, mm. because I had booked hotel, but I got there and seen that they had been given to someone else. Wow. So for the first week, I was so I think, yeah, that was pretty challenging because eventually I did stay and write um, some stories for the new humanitarian, the Guardian. Like, you know, stories that... Um, when I was going there, I knew I was going to do them when I was going there, but I never knew that the you know it's like dreams like you know they might come to fruition, they might not. Um, so reporting all of that with very tiny budgets, no mm-hmm. health insurance. Um, yeah, now that I think about it, I think that was pretty challenging. Uh, yeah, and then navigating through the waters, you know, you have to pay fixers, but you know you can't pay them the way that others pay them. Mm-hmm. So um, and then getting permission to report getting permission from the Nigerian army to go to certain places is, is really terrible because um, the Nigerian army, for all the good work they do, they also have a lot of lapses. Mm. And it's almost like they're afraid that at every point you move, you're going to discover them. You know, <laughs> Forgetting that you might also discover the good work they've done. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah so it was, it was a challenging period. You know? So I, I'm going to group all of the stories that I did between 2015, 2017. Yeah. Um, reporting on that return... And for months living there has been the most challenging, I think. Yeah. Kind of to follow up on that, what I mean, I know this is probably a difficult question to answer, but what are what are some things that you want listeners to know about Boko Haram um, that you know, or sort of misconceptions that you want to you know try mm-hmm. to challenge um, given um, your extensive it's, coverage? Of- it's it's and and this is the same with so many other things on the continent, right? Mm-hmm. The issue of Boko Haram is multifaceted, right? Even though it all boils down to one thing being poverty, ungoverned spaces, and marginalization of people, but it's so multifaceted. Mm -hmm. And many people think it started in 2009 Mm. when the founder died, but it's not, you know, it started way before, Mm -hmm. way longer, and, you know, several things plugged in. Like Sambisa Forex, for example, where where Boko Haram was used as their headquarters for, for, for a long period of time, right? Sambisa Forest is, you know, so many years ago, so one of the Nigerian heads of state, I can't remember who, wanted to use it as a training camp. Mm. Yeah, right? so, now, Sambisa is huge. It used to be forest reserve. Yes. Many people don't know this. Uh, and there's also another thing. People tell you, oh, I can't go to Nigeria because it's Boko Haram. I'm mm. like, um, <laughs> even Abuja that's in the north is, mm. is, Abuja is by road at least 12 or 14 hours. From, wow. from from the northeast, you know, it's Ab- pretty far. Yes, yeah, so yeah. it's you know, it's not like oh, once you step in Abuja, oh, you still have to duck, you know, for bombs. It, it's just like someone saying, I don't want to go to New York because of Harlem or because of uh, the Bronx. Yeah, 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 and even and even this, you know, Harlem is still even within within New York, mm-hmm. yeah, but yeah, still yeah. still the different spaces. Yeah. But Nigeria is so big; it's just thirty six states. Mm-hmm. Um, people in Lagos like. 
if you take a flight from Lagos across the coast, it's a 40, mm-hmm. 40 45 minute flight to Accra. Yeah. So you can get to Accra faster than you can get from Lagos to Abuja. Mm-hmm. You know, and then again, Abuja is not close to the northeast. So people, you know, um, yeah, it's a part of Nigeria that are unsafe, but you have to understand the distance and realize. Yeah. It's just like Burkina Faso, for example. It's not mm-hmm. everywhere that you know radical um, insurgencies are happening. There's, there's places people go to work and do good. Yeah. In, in Syria, mm-hmm. they, they, I'm pretty sure that there are people in Syria with pot, with um, what do you call it, now, Ferraris. I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure <laughs> it's not like the whole country. Yes, there are places, but you know, it's not like the whole country is enveloped mm-hmm. in, in in crisis. But Boko Haram, Boko Haram, but what's the problem with it? Like, what do they what what do they want? What, I mean, what's the claim? Why are they um, doing no? Boko, Boko Haram wants to set up a caliphate, you know, like government. You know, they want. They believe that the elected authority is not Islamic, right? And that so um, methods of you know people should not do their civic duty to the government, but they should do it towards to them. Yeah. Okay, but don't they have that in places like Jigawa? Where they have like the Sharia sh- 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 over there. Um. Okay. So, um. In I think it was in 2001, the Sharia mm-hmm. Code of Conduct was introduced. It was very controversial at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, there were um, ripple effects in 2001 with... Sorry, I'm debating a bit. Mm-hmm. In 2001 with the Miss World incident where Nigeria was also hosted. And mm-hmm. Long story. But, you know, there were many ripple effects as a result of that in 2000. Now, mm-hmm. um, the North, as we know it, is Nigeria has 36 states. The North is... 19 states mm-hmm. and then the core northern states are about nine or so but the north is split into three parts there's um the north central abuja falls under that mm-hmm. uh there is the northeast which is where northeast where um Obama is happening mm-hmm. and then there's the northwest right so um in these 19 states mm-hmm. Shara was supposed to have been implemented but i think only about four or five i'm not sure only about four or five fully implemented it. Jiga was probably one, but mm-hmm. Zamfara, mm-hmm. which is at mm-hmm. the very top of the northwest to the borders with Niger, mm-hmm. um, implemented it. Now, Sharia is slightly different from what Boko Haram... I don't know, I wouldn't say slightly, it's different from what Boko Haram is trying to enforce. Mm-hmm. Now, Boko Haram believes, and to an extent this is true, mm-hmm. that the politicians implementing Sharia have made it um, for just to benefit the rich you know, and so it's only the poor that are victims of Sharia and also that they have been corrupt, which is very true. Mm-hmm. The man himself who implemented Sharia, which was supposed to deal with adultery, um, child marriage, and a few other things, he mm-hmm. married a, an Egyptian teenager a few years ago, mm. right? He's, he was never dealt with. He, he went to the Senate. He has huge farms in San Farah State mm. that are run by... Uh, Indians or the Chinese, you know, like, you know, the Commonwealth mm-hmm. for himself, right? So Boko Haram feels that everyone, both, you know, secular governments and both Muslim le- Muslim leaders mm-hmm. implementing Sharia, that all of them have fallen short of, you know, um, what Mohammed asked. You know. so, so Boko Haram is like, oh, we need to implement something much stronger than Sharia. You know, that includes not allowing Western education, mm-hmm. not allowing... They burned down, the first things they used to burn down were, were um, police stations, classrooms, you know, tools that connected the people with, with the West in their eyes. Mm-hmm. You know? So um, so it's, it's slightly different from Sharia. Slightly different from Sharia. Interesting. Like, so... Actually, I, I'm going to take slightly back. It's mm-hmm. different from Sharia. Please. They, they're trying to implement something that is way stronger than stricter. And not Sharia is primarily focused on Muslims. Yeah. They want to stretch yeah. that cross board, whether you're Muslim, whether you're anyone. So, programs. what they're trying to do is almost like uh, they like when poor people are trying to take over, or when you know. People are looking at the government that is corrupt and they're trying to change things. It's not just religion. Ideally, ideally at the, that's that's yeah, that's it's at the base of the ideology. But the thing is, even Muhammad Yusuf, the father mm-hmm. of Boko Haram, mm-hmm. he was in you know in league with with um, the governor at the time of Borno State, which mm-hmm. is Borno is the best place of Boko Haram. Yeah, he was in league with the governor at the time, right? And so you know, um, at some point. I think the governor was paying them for, under some arrangement. Oh. I can't, I can't 
remember the exact details. But yeah. yeah, at some point, they were very, very close to the governor. Very, very close. And what happened was when there was now some fracas and the leader was arrested and then mm-hmm. killed in a tragedy custody. Mm-hmm. That's when the people rebelled against Spot, the government. Yeah. So they had been having their own um, parallel government, but yeah. still in tenterhooks with the main government in the state of time. So even Boko Haram, they are, they are going against the... Uh, initially, yeah. they were going against the tenets in which they were preaching mm-hmm. that all resist Western government. Wow. They, they had the implied or um, implicit support of the government at the time. So it's, it's, it's all very confusing because mm-hmm. the things you preach, you go against them. Um, even even I interviewed former wives of Boko Haram commanders and... <clears throat> And they did flamboyant lives in Sambisa, behind jewelry, you know, wow. some, of the, some of the very same things they preach against. Yes. So it's, <laughs> it's, 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 and this is why it's all very multi layered. You can't just see yeah. black and white and say, well, these people do it, you know. It's, it reminds me a bit about uh, the guy from Uganda, Kony. Mm-hmm. The guy from the Kony. LRA? Yeah. yeah. You know, he read, I mean, from you know, what I've been saying is he started, I went to the conference actually on the genocide thing that I recorded with uh, Claude. Mm -hmm. Initially, he was rebelling against the way they were treating them as far as their tribe or like the the zone that they live in, like they were mistreating them and at some point he started rebelling against that and he started overdoing it. Now, it's just like if you're being oppressed and you try to, you know, you start to say. Honestly, um, I think power is such that people people try to fight against the effects of power, the oppression, mm-hmm. you know, and then eventually they transition into the yes. oppressor. Look yeah. at Robert Mugabe, for example, yeah. mm-hmm. was a brilliant man who fought against um, um, Swapo, Swapo, was Swapo, Namibia, or was it, was it Zimbabwe? But anyways, you know, the whole Southern um, African mm-hmm. movement for independence and mm-hmm. fighting against um, colonial interests, you know, he got into power and then, you know, you can see what he became, yeah. right? So this everybody really, uh, you know, at the base level in, base level instincts, everyone wants power. Yeah. But then this is what they do with the power. Yeah. Yeah. But I also yeah. wonder the degree to which, like, if we look at sort of similar insurgencies, let's say, or you know, um, in, in like French speaking West Africa, there is also the, the kind of resentment towards, you know, the, the legacy of French imperialism, French militarism. Right. And so I, I wonder too about like, what, what is, you know, under Obama, AFRICOM and, and the U S's military presence expanded throughout the continent and, and we, we, you know, you and I were talking, we were talking earlier about Djibouti and how it's sort of divided up between all these foreign powers in terms of their own military bases, etc. So to what degree do you think has kind of foreign militarism on the African continent also fed into, um, you know, the, the, the growth or the, the expansion that, you know, of, of groups like Boko Haram? I don't know if there is a connection, but, you know. Um, seen... I mean, I feel like, um, I mean, so if you look back to the time in Guinea, for example, mm-hmm. where um, this guy who was fighting against um, Charles de Gaulle and French interests, um, mm-hmm. yeah. and then who later imposed his own his own um, dictatorship on them, right? So you have foreign governments trying to fight back, you mm-hmm. know, like, oh, you know, and then appearing, you know, the people uh, looking at the slightest real of you know, this foreign government might be my, my be our saviors. And then you also realize that um, this, and this is deeply underplayed, right? There, there's, there's just as local armies also commit extrajudicial killings and um, these crimes. Foreign armies also do that, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think I saw some reports somewhere about um, a camp in Niger, you know, where I, I can't remember so much. Um, but you know, so all of these are underplayed, and people see this, you know, and sometimes the, the foreign armies are in cahoots with. With, um, sure. with with the governments of that country, you mm-hmm. know, and these people all see it. And um, the thing about repression is that people will fight against it, you know, mm-hmm. whether for good or bad, whether for their own personal, you know, people will fight against it, and it will spring 
the spring all sorts of um, uh, all sorts of all sorts of things rise in the face. You know, there's never a vacuum in, in crime in um, in crime and in power. There's never a vacuum. Look at the situation with Libya, mm-hmm. for example. Mm-hmm. We took Gaddafi out. And so all of the people, Gaddafi had his jack boots down, as mm-hmm. terrible a leader as it was, I'm not making yeah. it but he had his jack boot down, and as soon as he took him out of the picture, right, all of these mm-hmm. people started swarming like bees. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so these things happen uh, because, like I said, there's, there's not going to be a vacuum in power. Mm-hmm. When one leaves, when, for example, when the foreign power leaves, another person is going to arrive. Mm-hmm. arrive. Or when, um, you know, there's, there's just always going to be all sorts of entities. Look at the situation between... Um, um, Rwanda and, and Uganda now mm-hmm. all trying to control the Congo. mineral interests mm-hmm. of the Congo. Mm-hmm. You know, there's at some point now I won't be shocked if some some um, guerrilla organization is rising up. Mm-hmm. You sure. know, this these things are always going to happen as long as uh, as long as greed remains and, mm-hmm. and and greed is in in tremendous supply where there is mineral mineral interest in Djibouti, for example. It, it may not have mineral interest, but it has. It's, it's a strategic location, right, mm-hmm. between um, the streets of uh, Mel. I've forgotten the name. Mm-hmm. It was a strategic location, right, on the Red Sea, mm-hmm. in the Gulf of Aden. You know, between the Middle East, between Africa. You know, and that's why China, Turkey, um, the U.S. Everyone is trying to go in there. You know, China, I, I think the U.S. a few years ago paid double um, the lease agreement that that they were paying before, so mm-hmm. that they could try and. And pay a price that is close, close or, or just as equal as what China is paying. You know, so there's yeah, and it's a very small. Country. So you think China is currently paying? So I think you came and paid more than the US did. At some point, China was paying way more, mm. but um, the US had to now double their lease um, and mm-hmm. to either match it or to surpass it. It's something, mm-hmm. something very similar in that range. Um, and you see all of these small countries, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has a base there. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. Turkey, I think Turkey is trying to build one there. The Italian yeah. and the French never left. You know, so um, so long as there is mineral interest, so there's money. You know, there's people. Uh, I'm pretty sure the French have some interest in the crisis in Cameroon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because if you look at it, the Anglophone region is where all the oil interests are, mm-hmm. and the French interest in that oil dates back to is it seventy two? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. before seventy two, when when Cameroon became a unitary state. You know, it's this. You know, at every every you have to realize that at every point in time there is interest, um, mineral or money or power or in is mining. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. there's something at play there, and that foreign governments or foreign armies are trying to get, and that um, when it suits them best, the local governments will also try and topple their foreign interests. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. in all of this, you the people, the locals are trapped in between. You know, yeah. It's just like two elephants are fighting, and then the, the grass in between is trapped. <laughs> At some point, the grass will sprout. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, something, maybe it might be the blood dripping, something is going to make grass sprout. Yeah. It's not going to stay the same forever. And when that happens, you have kids that extend for miles. Uh, yeah. Actually, on that, could you talk a little bit more about the crisis in Cameroon and sort of similarly tell us like what are some things what are some misconceptions about it it hasn't been covered very well certainly in the yeah. english speaking media yeah. um even though it's an anglophone cameroon yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so but the thing is cameroon is um it has 10 regions mm-hmm. and um most of these regions i think six oh my goodness i'm beginning to forget i think four regions are anglophone and six I, no, 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 sorry. Yes. Two regions are Anglophone mm-hmm. and the rest are, are Francophone. Mm-hmm. It's an overwhelmingly majority Francophone. Mm-hmm. And Cameroon is a country that has two, its national anthem has two different standards. Mm-hmm. One is in French, one is in English. Most of the English speakers don't know the French. Mm-hmm. Most of the French speakers don't know the English. That's, that's a country. Mm-hmm. It's, it's interesting. Now, um, I think part of the reason why Cameroon hasn't gotten that much. Um, it's, it's because Pobia has his lobbyists and mm-hmm. Pobia barely lives in the country he lives in Switzerland um, and then he's also old he's been here since 82 so I, I think the media is like yeah. oh you know, what's there to cover in Cameroon mm-hmm. <laughs> and then in addition to that um, Cameroon also has the rebels coming in from Central African Republic mm-hmm. right and then um, in the Adamawa region and in the far north, which borders with Nigeria, Nigeria yeah. you have Boko Haram. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's like a tripartite um, chaotic situation going on there. And um, 
um, the, 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 the English, another thing is that many of these refugees have also fled into Nigeria, mm. right? So, you know, the Big Brother Nigeria, you know, so because they're there, um, it's, there's, there's, there's no much, how will I put it now? Nigeria already sucks up the energy in the room, and then because of all these other small, small factors happening, mm-hmm. right? And okay, so where the refugees, if they were caught up or going into a smaller country that would cause chaos, mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, that's fine. But they're swallowed by Nigeria, right? Mm-hmm. Which, in spite of its many problems, can still take in more people, mm-hmm. you know? So um, I think all of this have had an effect on, on how the news has been covered. And um, Kobia did something of a master stroke earlier this year, a few months ago calling for a national dialogue you know, mm-hmm. and then immediately the UN Secretary General jumped in and said oh we endorse this and mm-hmm. um, not many people ask what are the modalities of this national mm-hmm. dialogue are, are people going to participate in you still have some people in prison for life mm-hmm. in Kondengi Central Prison in, 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 in Yaoundé mm-hmm. there's so many people who have been in prison there for life like geniuses um, lecturers who are taking um, I think it was in January 2018 or so they were arrested from Abuja, where they were having a meeting. Hmm. Um, because, and I say they, as um, the leaders of the movement trying to succeed, mm-hmm. you know, um, I think they call themselves the Amazonia Defense. They, well, the country they want to succeed and form is called Amazonia. Mm-hmm. Um, the people you know, who are fighting in the regions are called the Amazonia Defense Forces, but I don't remember the name of the council that was meeting. You know, so... Um, so yeah, you you have the fact that Nigeria can swallow in a lot of these things, and then there's also other crises. Um, yeah, that's 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 that's. I think you know, this is why you know, Cameroon really doesn't. This this there's not much to us on mm. Cameroon. It's it's not sexy. It's, you know, it's not sexy. Go, I, I want to go back to uh, uh, Boko Haram in a bit. What do you think could help with Boko Haram? Like, do you think? Negotiation could help, or um, now they're branching out and attacking, you know, the neighboring countries. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm not a military strategist, so I don't know for sure, but um, I don't think negotiation and payment for ransoms have helped at all. Because what has happened is that, um, and I think this started happening around uh, 2015 or 2016, 2015. because the government was desperate to get a queen, mm. right? The cheaper girl. So you have to look Jonathan, who hadn't. Who was so nonchalant mm. and took about two weeks to officially recognize that this girl was going to take him. And then you move on to Buhari, who's a general, and who mm. had, um, in the 80s, he had the track record of chasing another group called the, the, the Matasin, mm-hmm. right? It was similar radical, but way smaller. Yeah. Had, he chased, well, he, he, you know, he, he, he chased them. I think he chased them into Chad mm-hmm. or something. I can't remember, but he had this really remarkable military stints in the right. 80s yeah. that part of what made him a hero yeah. so um so it was expected to bring that to the table and the government yeah. really wanted a quick win you know mm-hmm. because it's historic you've taken an increment out of office yeah. and one of his um you know similar to what you might call his chapa mm-hmm. you know um was was this this girl so the government that replaced him that's the buhari government went on ahead and arranged a couple of swap deals, which it mm-hmm. continues to deny. Mm-hmm. All right, arranged these deals, and what happened was that money exchanged hands, and so both Boko Haram and the faction of it that has not allied itself with Islamic West Africa province, yeah. with ISIS to become yeah. Islamic West Africa province, right? Now had money to buy sophisticated equipment, and so for a while, 2016, 2017, early 2018, they were just attacking military facilities. Yeah. And so you strengthen them, and you essentially deregulated the kidnap for ransom industry in that region, yeah. right? That was one thing. Um, and, I mean, I mean, I think somehow the army can get around um, paying for ransom, even though there they will likely be civilian casualties. So I think they're also considering that, uh, you know, I can make excuses for them. But it's, it's a valid excuse. You don't yeah. want collateral damage. But then, on the other hand, you also have to realize that the army has been overstretched, right? The Nigerian army used to be one of the biggest yeah. in Africa. I used to go on peacekeeping missions, um, Ecomog, Sierra Leone, Liberia. Mm-hmm. Even, I think, in Gambia now, even the chief of army staff is still, is still Nigerian, yeah. or one of those countries. Uh, but, but that army has been overstretched, and there's no uh, money for... for so Boko Haram and ISWAP have routed and taken many of... Take, not many, but taken some 
key um, Amori mm -hmm. from from this Nigerian army, and then you also have um, the fact that corruption mm -hmm. people are diverting money meant for that into other things, right? And third, and most importantly, um, I'm sorry, I've lost my mm -hmm. train of thought. Um, the morale is down. Morale is down in the mm -hmm. army because of all of these factors that I've listed. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, Ten and most importantly, yes, I remember it now. The good look, Jonathan administration had engaged mercenaries, especially wow. from South Africa. There's a guy called Ibn Barlow mm -hmm. who had fought um, in Angola mm -hmm. and all that thing. He had this shit like around. So after that, um, I think it happened in 2014 with um, the cheaper girls, right? Mm -hmm. Around this 2014, early 2015, the mm -hmm. army was making solid progress against Boko Haram, knocking them back. And that's because we got mercenaries. I think yeah. they were also Ukrainian mercenaries. There's another mm -hmm. set of mercenaries. Yeah. But then Buhari came in and terminated it. Because, you know, we wanted an ego boost, or whatever his reason was. Yeah. We wanted an ego boost for the army, like, oh, our sure. army can do this yeah. itself, you know. But it didn't work. Even Balu put out the post. You know, it didn't work. You know, I remember there was a diplomatic role even between Nigeria and South Africa mm -hmm. because Nigeria went, you know, secret operation, um, clandestine operation, mm. try and buy arms from South mm -hmm. Africa, oh. right? Because there was the U.S. Diliahi law for human rights abuses. Nigeria mm -hmm. couldn't directly, oh, oh. yes, yeah. So, so there were all of these things, and then Buhari came in and you know, with his grand ideas that mm. have not worked. And then they refused to change the service chiefs. The service chiefs are past retirement age. Mm -hmm. They're past retirement age. Mm -hmm. You know, so but well, he knows what he's doing, but but I still so, so so I think I think the first step will be probably to you know to change, you know, the military hierarchy and like we oh. just scramble people. You know, let some people with fresh ideas come in. Right. You need you need new ideas. I don't know what these ideas will be, but you need new ideas. And I think you also need fresh legs, like these mercenaries. Yeah. They were they were doing the Lord's work. You know what you're saying, especially the the way they hit the uh, armies, because that's exactly what they're doing in like the Francophone side. You know, now they saw because they started attacking I mean it's hard to get to the army, so they attacking convoys or police headquarters. Even that's, they went, that's, that's, that is the modus operandi. Yeah, even they went to the city and they shot at the army base, even though they couldn't enter, supposedly. This is in Yeah, like in what they're doing in the city itself, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, listening to you, I realized why they're hitting those people. Because I thought they were just trying to scare people, but no, actually they're going after the armory. Yeah, they you know. were trying to get the armory yeah. and then they tried to get people to kidnap. Because the government is forced, oh, want to say we rescued people. You know, it's, it's, it, it makes good headlines. Mm -hmm. Nigerian government rescued 200, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes good headlines. So so they now know, okay, these are targets. And so the, 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 the um, insurgents now go after this. Yeah. It's interesting. But if we, if we sort of go back to the original kind of, when we first started talking about Boko Haram and, and the way that these kinds of movements, if you will, emerge and the structural reasons, right, that they emerge. What do you think needs to happen in Nigeria generally, right, um, beyond, you know, the the kind of area that, that um, these issues are confined to in order to eliminate some of the structural reasons people um might join a group like Boko Haram? And, and, and maybe if you can link that to the, I don't know if there is, but if you can link that to the demands of the Occupy Nigeria movement in 2012 and sort of what, you know, mm -hmm. are there connections there? Like, well, I, I'm, I guess I'm just interested generally, like, what are some of the structural issues that, you know, the, the Buhari government should be uh, taking on in order to just change, you know, the, the material conditions of people in Nigeria in general, all over the place, including in the north? Um, okay, so, uh, okay, okay, I think, I, think, I think we can make some link there between structural reasons for the rise of Boko Haram and um, and kidnapping in the northwest, mm -hmm. right? Around the borders with Chad and Niger mm -hmm. to um, occupy Nigeria. 